As the late 19th century ushered in significant changes among the Native Americans, tensions grew on the Great Plains as white settlers and Native American tribes battled for land and resources. The catalyst for this significant event was the Lakota Sioux spiritual movement known as the Ghost Dance. As the Ghost Dance gained momentum, it unknowingly inched closer to a collision with the worried American public, who saw it as a sign of a potential rebellion. In a surprising turn of events, the U.S. troops arrived at the Lakota encampment near Wounded Knee, and what followed was a devastating decision that set in motion a chain of events that would lead to one of the most traumatic and tragic chapters in American history. Welcome to another episode of The Native Journal, where we embark on an enlightening journey through the pages of history. In this video, our focus is on the unforgettable and touching tale of the Lakota's ghost dance movement and the events that unfolded around it. Stick around as we delve deep into this compelling chapter in Native American history. Remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel. In the 1880s, there was still ongoing armed conflict in the American West between the U.S. Army and the Native American population. This conflict persisted even though many Native American tribes had already been displaced or had their populations significantly reduced. One of the most intense battles in this series of wars occurred in 1876 at the Battle of Little Bighorn, involving the Sioux tribe. This conflict began in the mid-1850s when Chiefs Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse took up arms to protect the Black Hills, as the U.S. had violated the treaty that recognized this land as Sioux territory. Following the Battle of Little Bighorn, the Sioux forces gradually weakened, and Crazy Horse surrendered in 1877. The Sioux who had survived were living on various reservations but were later moved to a central reservation in the Dakota Territory. During this time, they were performing a ritual called the Ghost Dance. This dance was believed to have the power to remove white settlers from Native American lands and bring back peace and calm to the area. However, settlers were alarmed by the dance, describing it as having a mysterious and ghostly aura, which is how it got its name, the Ghost Dance. The Ghost Dance Ceremony originated in 1889 as part of a Native American religious movement. It was initiated by Wovoka, a Paiute religious leader who claimed to have received a direct message from Wakantanka, often translated as Great Spirit, during a vision. According to Wovoka, this message conveyed that the spirits of Native American ancestors would return to live in harmony with the remaining Native American communities for eternity. By performing the Ghost Dance, it was believed that these events would be hastened. Furthermore, there was a belief that the shirts worn during these ritual dances could protect against bullets. Additionally, followers of this movement believed that a series of catastrophic natural disasters would occur, leading to the elimination of all white people, while Native Americans would be spared. This religious movement rapidly spread among Native American communities across the continent, including Lakota reservations in South Dakota, Notably, Sitting Bull permitted Kicking Bear to teach the dance at Standing Rock, and it was also promoted by Short Bull at Rosebud Reservation, embraced by Spotted Elk at Cheyenne River, and supported by Red Cloud at Pine Ridge Reservation. These developments contributed to the growing tensions that eventually led to the involvement of U.S. troops in the Dakotas. By the autumn of 1890, government officials had grown concerned after reading messages and receiving reports. The prophecies of a messiah had captured the attention of 30 Indian reservations, but it had gained an incredibly enthusiastic following among the Lakota Sioux, also referred to as the Western Sioux. Due to the recent history of conflicts between the U.S. government and the Lakota Sioux, including the involvement of well-known figures like Sitting Bull, government agents began to pay particular attention to this community. Among all aspects of this new ritual that attracted attention, the physical intensity of the dancers stood out the most. The central element of the ghost dance involved people forming a circle, holding hands, and moving clockwise. This circle included men, women, children, the healthy, the sick, and those on the brink of death, as described by one observer. The Lakota Sioux incorporated some symbols from their primary religious ritual, the sun dance, into the ghost dance. In this adaptation, Sioux believers would cut down and then re-erect a tree, often a young cottonwood, at the center of their dance circle.
they would adorn this tree with offerings to the spirits, such as colored ribbons and sometimes an American flag. Near the tree, holy men oversaw the ceremony, gathering the participants, who initially sat in a circle around the tree. Prayers were offered, and occasionally, a sacred potion was shared among the participants. Then, the dancers would collectively emit a plaintive cry that had a powerful emotional impact. Following these initial steps, the dancers would rise and begin singing, unaccompanied by drums or other instruments, while the circle started to rotate. Some American witnesses, astonished and disturbed by the zeal of the ghost dance ritual, issued stern warnings. One government agent reported that the Native Americans seemed willing to defy all orders, even if it meant going to war to pursue their obsession with the dance. At Pine Ridge, an agent described the Indians as dancing in the snow in a wild and fierce manner. Another agent criticized the dance, saying it was physically exhausting for the participants and suggested that steps should be taken to stop it. Concerns extended to the welfare of women as well. A witness at Pine Ridge feared that unconscious women might be mistreated, describing how they would collapse, covering themselves with their clothing and revealing parts of their bodies. Another observer deemed the dance as indecent, demoralizing, and disgusting. For these witnesses, the ghost dance represented a display of irrationality, a rejection of the Victorian decorum taught by missionaries, both in body and spirit. In a way, they were partly correct. However, for the Lakota and other Native Americans, the ghost dance was simultaneously a strikingly new and reassuringly familiar practice. Ghost dancers sought a fresh spiritual connection, an attempt to restore the closeness with the Creator that they felt had been lost. Crucially, the appeal of this religion lay in its ability to unite Indians as a community and express their history, families, and identity. The ghost dance provided believers with the opportunity, as one Sioux evangelist put it, to embrace their Indianness once more. As this practice continued, the American settlers became more worried, and the Messiah craze of 1890 reflected the intense American focus on Native American dances and their determined efforts to put a stop to them. This obsession had its roots in the American desire for assimilation, a concept that was, in its own way, as hopeful as the belief in the second coming of Christ. Imagine a utopian dream in a rapidly globalizing society where racial, cultural, and class divisions had vanished. That's what many Americans yearned for. In their efforts to achieve this, policymakers echoing the Puritans' disapproval of physical enthusiasm launched a campaign against Native American dances. In 1882, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Henry M. Teller, issued orders to ban traditional dances deemed pagan, like the sun dance, scalp dance, and more, in an effort to bring Native Americans in line with conventional Christian customs. The situation was incredibly frustrating, even though it seemed like an easy problem to solve. Native Americans had very little power. They weren't citizens and remained under federal authority without the right to vote. They relied on appointed officials known as Indian agents for their basic needs. People like Dawes believed that through education, setting a good example and some force, they could transform Native Americans into responsible citizens. Many believed that if Congress mandated and Indian agents enforced a strict assimilation policy, it would eliminate Native American culture but preserve the individual. As one assimilation advocate put it, this way, Native Americans would become part of mainstream society, setting an example for millions of immigrants and African Americans, ultimately leading to a time when racial divisions would fade away. For Americans, the challenge of assimilation was a significant social issue during the ghost dance of 1890. The enthusiasm for assimilating others, combined with the fear that some might resist assimilation, explains why the ghost dance was so troubling. To most white Americans, the dance itself suggested that assimilation had not tamed what they saw as the savage nature of Native Americans, and it raised doubts about the inevitability of American conquest. In this context, the events in South Dakota were more than just dances or another Native American uprising. Something much more significant was at stake for Americans. However, well into the autumn of 1890, ghost dances remained nothing more than a curiosity serving as exciting stories for readers in distant cities. Although the intensity of the dances had increased early in the fall, officials at the scene were generally not alarmed. 
As late as the first week of November, only one Indian agent in South Dakota had requested military intervention. The others believed that the dance would naturally fade away. Most local newspapers provided very little or no coverage of the ghost dance. However, on November 13, President Harrison ordered the army to enter the Sioux reservations to support overwhelmed officials and prevent any outbreak that may put in peril the lives and homes of the settlers of the adjacent states. With one-third of the entire U.S. Army moving into some of the most remote and impoverished communities in the United States, the Ghost Dance War quickly became the largest military operation since General Lee's surrender at Appomattox. The arrival of columns of soldiers caused panic among the Native Americans and, by hinting at the possibility of war, terrified many settlers who had not felt threatened until that moment. After initially treating the Ghost Dance as a curiosity, the press now sensationalized the situation, captivating a significant portion of the nation's 63 million people with stories of imminent outbreaks by violent savages. It didn't matter that there were fewer than a quarter of a million Indians left in the United States, with only 18,000 of them being Lakota Sioux. Moreover, there were only about 4,000, 200 ghost dancers, most of whom were children, their mothers, and the elderly. Despite these facts, some sources quoted estimates of 15,000 fighting Sioux, and there were rumors of an impending Sioux outbreak. Some even reported that thousands of armed Indians had surrounded the reservation and killed settlers and soldiers. Eventually, the federal government banned ghost dance ceremonies and mobilized the largest military deployment since the Civil War. General Nelson Miles arrived on the prairie with part of the 7th Cavalry, which had been annihilated at the Battle of the Little Bighorn 14 years earlier, and ordered the arrest of tribal leaders suspected of promoting the ghost dance movement. In mid-December, James McLaughlin, the agent at Standing Rock Reservation, located about 275 miles north of Wounded Knee, ordered the Indian police to arrest Sitting Bull, one of the most famous Lakota chiefs still alive. McLaughlin had a personal grudge against Sitting Bull, and he saw an opportunity to use the turmoil caused by the ghost dance, which had taken place at Sitting Bull's camp, to have him removed from the reservation. On the morning of December 15, when the police arrived at Sitting Bull's home to take him into custody, some of his angry supporters opened fire. In the ensuing chaos, the police shot Sitting Bull in the head and chest, resulting in his death. This event sparked panic and fear across the reservation, causing Lakota Indians there and on other reservations to flee their homes in search of refuge from the approaching troops. As a result, on December 28, a group of starving ghost dancers who had left their homes on Cheyenne River Reservation surrendered to Colonel James Forsyth's 7th Cavalry at Wounded Knee Creek. As tensions escalated and the morning of December 29 arrived with the sound of a bugle, American soldiers mounted their horses and surrounded the Lakota. A medicine man who started to perform the ghost dance cried out, Do not fear, but let your hearts be strong. Many soldiers are around us and have many bullets, but I am assured their bullets cannot penetrate us. He implored the heavens to scatter the soldiers like the dust he threw into the air. However, the soldiers, not relenting, approached each lodge, confiscating axes, rifles, and other weapons. During an attempt to take a weapon from a Lakota individual, a gunshot suddenly sounded. It wasn't certain who fired the first shot, but immediately after, American soldiers unleashed a barrage of gunfire from four rapid-fire Hotchkiss guns. Along with rifle and pistol fire, it inflicted heavy casualties on the mostly unarmed Lakota villagers. Indian men who weren't immediately killed did their best to resist the troops, using a few guns, knives, rocks, and their bare hands. Among the Sioux men at Wounded Knee were some of the most experienced close-range fighters in the region. Meanwhile, women, children, and elderly people fled up the creek to escape the violence. After hours of gunfire, the gulch was filled with bodies. Some were still alive, but most had perished. Tragically, some victims had been chased down and found three miles away. In a horrifying turn of events, some had their sacred shirts taken as gruesome souvenirs. Around 150 Lakota were killed, although some historians suggest the number was even higher, possibly double. Shockingly, two-thirds of the casualties were women and children. Additionally, the army had also suffered losses. 
The 7th Cavalry had dozens of wounded and lost 30 troopers. They took 38 wounded Indians with them, but left the dead and more of the injured to face the harsh Dakota winter. As night fell, the temperature dropped significantly and a fierce blizzard blew in from the north. The bodies froze solid. Three days later, when soldiers and a burial party returned, they found some wounded Lakotas still clinging to life and surviving infants in the arms of their deceased mothers. Unfortunately, most of these infants, except for one and many others, didn't survive. Soldiers loaded wagons with the bodies of the dead Indians. These bodies appeared strangely similar to the haunting plaster casts of the victims of the Mount Vesuvius eruption in Pompeii. Some froze in gruesome positions they fell in, while others were twisted, with their hands reaching out and mouths wide open, each one a clear sign of the pain they endured, the harsh cold, and the unstoppable force of death. A photographer arrived to capture these scenes, which soon became popular postcards. The gravediggers laid to rest the bodies of 84 men, 44 women, and 18 children. More had perished, but some were taken by their families, or managed to leave the area before succumbing, perhaps finding refuge in another camp or dying alone on the desolate plain. The dead bodies were taken to the nearby Episcopal Church, where they were laid out in two rows beneath festive wreaths and other Christmas decorations. A few days later, a burial team arrived, dug a pit, and placed the frozen bodies in a mass grave. To make matters worse, some survivors were transported to Fort Sheridan in Illinois and imprisoned for their presence at Wounded Knee. It wasn't until William Buffalo Bill Cody took custody of them for his Wild West show that they were released. The show didn't portray their people positively, but it was better than being in a jail cell. Although General Miles, who wasn't present at Wounded Knee, condemned the incident as the most abominable military blunder and a horrifying massacre of women and children. The U.S. Army awarded the Medal of Honor its highest honor to 20 members of the 7th Cavalry who participated in the tragic event. While we can examine old photographs, read faded letters, and scan the fragile pages of aging newspapers, death is unforgiving and leaves few traces. We cannot fully account for all those who lost their lives at Wounded Knee. Religion is a deeply personal matter, but it can provide solace and guidance to individuals navigating a harsh and challenging world. The adoption of the ghost dance by Native Americans was, in part, a response to the changing circumstances that had created a profound existential crisis. Much of the appeal of this religious movement lay in how it addressed the dramatic shifts in their material world. It helped Native Americans grapple with the consequences of the Industrial Revolution, the rise of powerful corporate entities in the United States, and the growing bureaucracy of the state, all of which accompanied the March of Modernity. The ghost dance offered a way for Native Americans to adapt to life under industrial capitalism in a nation where literacy was crucial for dealing with legal proceedings and government offices that oversaw many aspects of Native American life. In essence, following the American invasion, the ghost dance provided believers with a means to navigate and assert new forms of control, not just over their spiritual beliefs but also over their governance. Therefore, the massacre at Wounded Knee was not the suppression of naive or primitive individuals, but rather the suppression of pragmatic people who were seeking a peaceful path into the 20th century. What's remarkable is that this religion didn't easily fade away. The ghost dance held such promise that Native American people continued practicing it long after the tragedy at Wounded Knee. It continued on the Southern Plains and in Canada well into the 20th century. In many places, it left a lasting impact on Native American rituals, some of which continue to exist today. Thank you for watching. We would love you to share your thoughts on this story in the comment box below. Also, remember to subscribe and click on the notification bell to uncover more captivating stories on this channel.